This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Holland 44. Holland 44 was released in 2017 by GMT Games and designed by Mark Simonich. This game supports up to two players and takes from 4 to 15 hours to play. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Another way you can support the channel is by liking and subscribing. Liking a video helps me understand what content is successful with this audience. As for subscribing, new content appears on this channel first. While you may have found your way here from Board Game Geek or other sites, in the future, I'll also be adding more exclusive content that may only be found here. The best way to be informed when I upload new videos is to subscribe and click the bell icon for notifications. Once again, thanks for watching, and now let's get to the video. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Holland 44. In this episode, we're going to continue where we left off in the sequence of play with the movement phase. However, before we jump into the rules for movement, let's take a moment to fully ground ourselves in the game's hex rules for stacking and zones of control. Let's begin by discussing the stacking limits for units in a single hex. Holland 44 actually has two stacking limits. The game allows a maximum of two units and one free stacking unit in a single hex to contribute to a battle. Any units stacked above this limit in the hex are ignored. Therefore, when conducting combat with an overstacked hex, the owning player must declare which units will contribute to the battle. The second stacking limit is for unit elimination. Holland 44 has set a maximum of 9 units allowed in a hex. Following the movement and combat phase, any excess units above this limit must be eliminated. The owning player gets to decide which units to eliminate. As you can see, Holland 44 has a very generous range between its two stacking limits before units are eliminated. In an overstacked hex, Players just need to be sure to declare which units are contributing their stats to a battle. To be clear, these exclusions include defense strength, morale, and armor rating calculations. There is an exception though. Overstacked units may be used in a determined defense, which we will cover a little bit later. One final exception. In the movement phase, mechanized units may only enter an already overstacked hex use tactical movement. Basically, a mechanized unit needs to begin its movement within one to two hexes from the overstacked hex to enter. Now that we've outlined the different stacking limits, let's discuss some unit exceptions that may stack in the hex without adding to the total. The first exception are units with a white border. These are known as free stacking units. The stacking limit of a hex allows two regular units and one free stacking unit. Free stacking units include artillery, bridging, engineer, and flak units. There are also conditional free stacking units, which are one-step armored units. These units can qualify as a free stacking unit if no other armored unit is in the hex. Players are allowed one free stacking unit per hex but additional units of this type are counted normally. The second exception are for Demi Battalions. Demi Battalions count as one unit for the purpose of stacking, but are represented by two counters. A Demi Battalion counter can be identified by the color bar behind its unit ID. The third exception are for Airborne Supply Heads and Unknown Units on their Unrevealed side. These have no stacking value at all, but no more than one is allowed per hex. Just be aware, once an unrevealed unit is revealed, and it's not a garrison that's immediately removed, that revealed unit then has a stacking value. Next, let's discuss Zone of Control. Holland 44, like many war games, 
utilizes a zone of control game mechanic to represent the local influence of a military presence. A unit that occupies a hex controls that hex. That unit also extends its influence to the surrounding six hexes. This is known as its zone of control. A unit's zone of control extends across all types of terrain except unbridged major rivers and lake hex sides. These terrain types cancel out the unit's influence in that hex space. For example, let's say a major river ran through our example map. Without a bridge spanning the river's hex edge, the SS unit's zone of control will not be able to extend across the river. Alright, let's reset our map and continue. Now, when an opposing unit moves into a hex space overlapped by a zone of control, they must stop. If the player wants to move that unit again in the next movement phase, they have a choice. They can move to another hex space within that zone of control and stop again, or they can move out of the zone of control, but it costs them two additional movement points to do so. Therefore, a unit could skirt around the enemy unit's zone of control, or just trudge through it. What is unique about this game series is that when two friendly units that are two steps and higher overlap their zones of control, they can form barriers called bonds. There are two types of bonds that can be formed. Hex side bonds prevent a unit from crossing and hex space bonds prevent a unit from entering that hex. Now, there is also another way to create a hex side bond, and that's with a friendly entry area. Let's say that the northern end of our example map is an axis friendly entry area. The two northern SS units can form hex side bonds with the entry area just like any other friendly unit. Be aware though, only hex side bonds can be formed with a friendly entry area, not hex space bonds. Keep this rule in mind when units are near friendly entry areas at the edge of the map. Each bond type also has similar restrictions. Units may not cross a hex edge bond or enter a hex space bond. If forced to retreat into either, they are eliminated. Units may not advance after combat into them unless they are entering the defender's vacated hex, and supply can never be traced through them. There are ways to dissolve a zone of control bond. Obviously, the player could eliminate one of the enemy units and bring the bond down that way. However, if removing a unit through combat is not an option, there is another way. For a hex side bond, Positioning a unit on either side will neutralize it. Once a hex space bond is formed, it cannot be negated except by removing a unit through combat. The rules state that a hex space bond is negated when the hex contains an enemy unit. This is extremely confusing because a hex space bond cannot be entered after it's formed. I believe what the rule is trying to tell you is that if a player wants to move a unit within range of another friendly unit, they can't form a bond if the space between them is occupied by an enemy unit. This seems really obvious, but if you know of a different explanation for this rule, let me know in the comments below. Okay, up to this point in our example, to simplify illustrations, I've only showed enemy zones of control and bonds for the German SS units. However, all units that control a hex space can generate a zone of control, and two-step and above units can generate bonds with each other. If we place another British unit across from the SS unit's hex space bond, it doesn't negate that bond. Instead, the British units establish their own hex space bond on top of it. Therefore, neither side can enter this hex space and one of the units creating their respective bond would need to be eliminated to remove it. Therefore, players will need to scrutinize the game map to determine which hexes are overlapped by a zone of control and where bonds exist. The bottom of page 6 in the rulebook provides several examples to review. Reference this page if you encounter a situation where you're not sure whether the bond is legal or not.
Before we move on to the next section, let's also look at the effect of terrain on bonds. A zone of control bond cannot extend through a city hex or across an unbridged river or lakeside hex. And vehicle units cannot form a zone of control bond into a hex or across a hex side they are prohibited from entering or crossing, which makes perfect sense. I've replicated examples from the rulebook to illustrate how minor and major rivers, city hexes, and the presence of enemy units affect bonds. As you can see, city and river hexes when matched with an adjacent enemy unit may also be used to negate bonds. Now, let's move on to the next section. Now, let's discuss the movement phase. In this phase, all combat units belonging to the player taking their turn may move. Each unit has a movement allowance that can be found in the lower right hand corner of the counter. This represents the number of movement points the unit may spend for movement during this phase. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, Holland 44 has three types of movement, tactical movement, tech movement, and extended movement. Each of these has specific benefits and restrictions for players that use them. However, the underlying game mechanic for all movement is tech, which stands for terrain entry cost. Let's take a closer look at how this works. Each hex space on the game map has a specific terrain type assigned to it, and that terrain type will dictate the cost that a unit must pay to enter that hex. These costs are different based on whether the unit is non-mechanized or mechanized. I've shown the cost for each terrain type at the bottom of the screen. The number before the slash is the cost for non-mechanized units and the number after the slash for mechanized units. Also note that vehicles in the mechanized class are prohibited from entering polder or marsh hexes. For less densely populated villages and towns, reference the other terrain type shown in that hex. Many village and town hexes have clear terrain. City hexes are more densely populated and have their own terrain cost of 1 for both non-mechanized and mechanized units. And now that you understand the basics for terrain entry cost, let's look, look at the other types of movement. Tactical movement, what I call the game's low gear speed, ignores entry costs but limits units to one or two hexes. Units using either tactical movement or tech movement are still eligible to conduct combat. However, both of these movement types do have restrictions. Units may not cross a prohibited hex side. They must stop in the first hex overlapped by an enemy zone of control. They may not cross or enter zone of control bonds, and for infantry class units, they must start their movement in a hex adjacent to an unbridged canal to cross it. Following our analogy, if tactical movement is a unit's low gear, and standard tech movement is their mid gear, then extended movement is the high gear. Extended movement grants a unit two additional movement points. However, Pushing a unit beyond its standard range has some restrictions. Units that use extended movement may not move adjacent to an enemy unit, including unknown units, units in full retreat, and units across major rivers or lake hex sides. A unit starting its move adjacent to an enemy unit can still use extended movement. However, they also cannot end their move in a hex containing another friendly unit. This restriction does not apply to units using normal movement that end their move with a unit that used extended movement. Next, let's look at some terrain and situation specific rules for movement. First, let's discuss infiltration, which allows units to subvert enemy zones of control under special conditions. The infiltration ability may only be employed when using tactical movement and allows any number of units to ignore an enemy zone of control in city hexes and in woods and town hexes with a special maneuver. The city method of infiltration is pretty straightforward. By using an adjacent city hex and tactical movement, a unit can pass through an enemy zone of control. 
The Woods and Town Hex's method is a little more complicated. First, a two-step unit, in good order, forgoes their movement and places a spent marker in their hex. Then, other friendly units may now pass through that hex using tactical movement without having to stop for the enemy zone of control. However, the unit with the spent marker may not attack in the upcoming combat phase. Next, let's talk about road movement. A major part of Operation Market Garden's strategy is not only securing the bridges, but highways as well. And you're about to see why. Road movement's rules are as follows. A unit that follows the path of a road may use the reduced cost of the road. Whenever a road crosses a minor river, a bridge is assumed to exist. Whenever a road enters a town or a city hex, units are assumed to be using the road movement cost if following the path of the road. The road cost may also be used when moving into and out of an enemy zone of control. There are three types of roads in the game. Primary roads, secondary roads, and minor roads. While non-mechanized units, those on foot, do not receive a bonus for using roads, mechanized units do. Non-mechanized units on a primary road pay a third of a movement point per hex. Secondary roads, a half a point. Minor roads, though, cost the same one point per hex as a clear or city hex. Therefore, you can see that securing a primary road can greatly extend the range of non-mechanized units. And, for the German player, denying access to these roads and deploying traffic markers are key strategies to slowing the Allies down. Next, let's discuss crossing waterways on their own as well as with bridges and ferries. First, let's look at the game's waterways. There are minor rivers, canals, and major rivers. To cross a minor river, non-mechanized units cost an additional one movement point and mechanized units add an additional two movement points to do so. Vehicle units may never cross an unbridged waterway except when using a ferry or an engineer unit. On the rulebook's unit list, this would be everything shaded in blue. For canals and major rivers, eligible units can only use ta tactical movement to cross. Next, let's talk about crossing rivers using bridges and ferries. If there is a bridge or ferry present on a hex side to cross a waterway, they have their own additional cost for movement. Normal bridges have no additional costs, which make them the best option to cross a waterway. Railroad bridges cost one additional movement point for non-mechanized units and two additional movement points for mechanized units. Railroad bridges are designed for trains and take more effort to traverse. Finally, there are ferries, the worst option for getting across a river. To use a ferry, both sides of the river must be clear of enemy units and enemy zone of control. And, units can only use a ferry with tactical movement. There are also some restrictions based on the side using the ferry. Each ferry has the capacity to carry one step per turn. The type of step does not matter for the allied player, but the German player is restricted to infantry type units during AM and PM turns. During night turns, he may ferry across any type of step, including a vehicle type unit. Now, major rivers may also be crossed using an engineer unit to create their own kind of special ferry. When an engineer unit conducts this action, the unit is flipped over to its ferry side. An engineer ferry has a capacity of six steps per turn, but only one of these steps can be a vehicle type unit. When building a ferry, the engineer unit can move to the major river hex site and create the ferry all in the same movement phase. However, it cannot do this with extended movement. There are also some restrictions to creating a ferry. Once a friendly unit uses the engineer unit as a ferry, the engineer unit may no longer move during the movement phase. And an engineer unit cannot be used as both a ferry and for a major river assault in the same turn. Next, let's talk about dense terrain. Movement in woods, polder, and marsh hexes has a rule for terrain density. Essentially, the deeper a unit travels into these hex types, additional movement cost is incurred. 
For example, the first two wood hexes entered during a movement phase costs the indicated rate, but all wood hexes after that cost an additional one movement point per hex. Once a unit exits dense terrain, the movement cost reverts to normal. On the game map, you may also encounter a polder and woods combo hex. This is treated the same as a polder hex, except the armor shift cannot be earned in it. And as a reminder, vehicle type units may only enter and exit polder and marsh hexes if following the path of a road. Otherwise, entry is prohibited. And this feels like a good place to stop for this episode. In the next episode of this series, we will cover the game's combat. So make sure you're subscribed and click the bell icon for notifications. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.